Okay, if you have your Bibles tonight, open to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to just look at a really a simple Christmas message and a couple of things I want to talk about in line with the Christmas story. And I did a, last night and in today, I've, I've done quite a bit of study and, and run in the references and especially as you read through the Christmas story, and I'm, I'm not going to use this tonight, I just want to mention it. As you go through the Christmas story, all of the times that it says that, and this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then if you go back and you read those passages in the Old Testament, and not just the verses that are quoted in the New Testament, but sometimes maybe two or three chapters and kind of get the, the picture and the idea of what was being prophesied. And uh, it, it, it's interesting. And in particular, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, is one of the, the main prophecies. And I am going to mention that tonight, but we're not going to really go back and look at it. But if you go and read, the, especially that chapter, it, it's just, it, it's awesome, the prophecies that are given in that chapter and the things that God says. But tonight, we want to look at an, another thought. And I want to begin by reading in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 22 when the angel came in, in, uh, to a, into Joseph in a dream. And he begins by saying, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. And just real quick, the Christian standard uses the word divorce there. And they are only engaged. The old biblical word was betrothed. And that was a legal contract, a legal deal. The, the, the endowment had been paid and everything was set up. So for them to break up at this point, they had to legally get a divorce. And so that, that's why the... Christian standard puts divorce there because that's what had to happen. It says, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And <clears throat> see, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him, and he married her. But he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. And then if you would turn to Luke chapter 1. And let's, let's read a few verses over here. Where Gabriel comes to Mary and talks to her. Luke chapter 1. And let's begin in verse 26. And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then he goes on and tells her about Elizabeth. In verse 37, he says, For nothing will be impossible with God. 
And then verse 38, Mary says, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. So this is the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ, both to Mary and to Joseph. And there's a couple of things that, that to me are very important in this, but in particular to what I want to talk about tonight. And if you'll notice in both of these announcements, there's no mention of the Gentiles. Everything that is spoken is spoken either to the house of David, to the house of Jacob, or to the Jews. And so that leads me to think or to the assumption that this should have been a time of great joy because the angel didn't make any, any issue about who this child would be. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. So to them, it should have been, I mean, this should have been the most festive nine, ten months that Israel ever had. Everything that they had been expecting, everything that they had understood from the prophets was about to come to pass. The Lord was going to send the Messiah, the one that had been promised to them, and to their thought processes, especially what they were looking for in a Messiah, this should have been a time of expectation that when this Messiah grows up, he's going to lead us to the kingdom and restore Israel to all the glory that was prophesied for it. So all of this should have led to a great time of, of joy. And especially when you consider the announcement and the message that the angels gave to the shepherd there in chapter 2. If you look at verse 11, he said, Today in the city of David a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. And he says in verse 10, he says, But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And then verse 13 and 14 and suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favors. So this message that was given to all of these people, it should have been the greatest message they ever heard. It should have inspired in the hearts of everyone in Israel joy, expectation. Uh, it should make them be like we were when we were little kids and we were waiting on the Christmas tree so we could get around there. I remember at Mama Lita's, after supper, we were ready, you know, and it just killed us to have to wait for them to clean up and get everything put away. And even on Christmas morning, that was probably the only morning of the year that I ever woke up early was Christmas morning because we were excited and that's the way it should have been for them. And for some of them, it was. For Mary and Joseph, they were excited. Everything that the Lord had told them. Elizabeth, and remember we looked at her a couple of weeks ago and, and the way that she responded to the message and to meeting Mary after they were both pregnant. I think about the wise men. You know their conversations while they were traveling to Jerusalem and then when they went to find the baby. And how they fell down and worshipped him and offered him gifts. I think about Simeon and his message, his prophecy. We're going to look at it Sunday morning and, and the things that he prophesied. And, and he was excited and his words were, Lord, now your servant can go in peace, can, can die in peace. And then Anna and the shepherds. And I think about the shepherd's story. We, we're not going to read it. But it gives us the idea that when they heard this message, they got together and they said, man, let's go. Let's get to Jerusalem and, and see this thing that was told us. So for some, it was a time of joy. It was a time of great expectation. And knowing that everything that they had prayed for as Israelites, everything that they had hoped for, everything that they had trusted that one day God would give them, was now here in the Messiah, in this babe. But for others, it was a time of fear, and it was a time of violence. Back in Matthew chapter 1, we have the story here, and it's a story that, that's part of the Christmas story, but it's not one that we necessarily really like to think about. Beginning in verse 16, it says, Then Herod... When he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he flew into a rage, and he gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem 
who were two years old and under in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. That's the Jeremiah 31 passage, and I encourage you to go read that whole chapter and, and see the promises and the prophecies there. But for some people, it wasn't a time of joy and celebration. It wasn't a time of expectation. It was a time of fear. Herod was afraid that he would lose his kingdom. He was afraid that people would flock to this, this newborn king, this Messiah, and that he would lose his power. The leaders of Israel, the priests, the Sadducees, they all got caught up in this same thought and they rejected Jesus and they did it. They did it because they were afraid they would lose their power and their authority. The, the way of life that they had set up for themselves and they did it to keep all the people from following Jesus. And eventually they crucified him thinking that that was the end of it. I remember one thing that Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 13. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He said, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you don't go in and you don't allow those entering to go in. And that's what they did. So the message to them wasn't one of joy. It wasn't one of expectation it was one of fear and, in some cases, violence. And then for others, a third group of people that are in the story, well, they didn't even know what had happened. And even when they did hear rumors about something was going on, well, you know, hey, it's just something that's going on. They, they just went about their lives like nothing had happened or, or, or was happening. I think about the innkeeper. When Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, there was no room in the inn. But the innkeeper said, hey, go ahead and, you know, you can stay. And I'm thinking, man, if I'd been that innkeeper and if I'd have known what was going on, I'd have cleared out the whole inn and, and gave Mary and Joseph the whole place. But he didn't even know what was happening. He just, all he was concerned about, he was making money because everybody was having to come to Bethlehem. And, and I guarantee you, every room he had was filled up and there were people waiting for those that were there to move out so they could move in. That's all he cared about. Think about Caesar Augustus and how God used him, Luke chapter 2 and verse 1. God used him to appoint this, this tax, this, this levy and registration that went on. History tells us that the Romans did this once every 14 years. And they did it because most of the nations that they had conquered were conscripted into the army. And there weren't as many Roman soldiers as we tend to think they were. Most of the army was conscripted, and that's why they did this. Most of the people, or the men from the age of 15 up to around 30, were all conscripted into the army, and that's why they did this. They did it to levy a tax and to raise their army. And so to Caesar Augustus, even though the, the king of all the universe was born, in his kingdom, he didn't even know it, didn't know what was happening. All he knew is he was raising an army, and he was going to keep power and get more riches. So those are all the things that happened when it should have been a time of great joy. It should have been a time when, when people were full of hope and expectation. Many of them weren't. And today is no different. It's the same way in our world today. First of all, there are those that fight against the things of God, even today, and in particular when they pertain to Jesus. They want, it, they want it all stopped. They want it shut down. Even in governments today, not only here in the United States, but all across the world, there are governments today, the European Union and others that are fighting against the things of God, and they want to keep everything in control the way that they want it. There are scoffers, not only people that, that fight against it, but there are scoffers. And they scoffed about his, his first coming, even with, we see it with Herod and with some of the others. But turn, if you would, to, to Mark chapter 6. 
and look at a couple of verses here in Mark chapter 6 about scoffers. Beginning in verse 1. In speaking of Jesus, it says, He left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did he get these things? They said, What is this wisdom that has been given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Now listen to verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary? brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Now, when you read those three verses, there's one thing in particular that really stands out. Nobody in that culture ever introduced themselves or were called by their mother's name. All of those people you read, Simon Bar-Jonah, that bar That means son of. So when you're reading that, you're reading Simon. He was the son of Jonah. All the way through scripture, nobody ever identifies by their mother. But yet when they questioned Jesus, rather than saying, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? They said, isn't this Jesus the son of Mary? What they were doing is they were throwing a slap at him. They were questioning Jesus. His birth. Now, they knew the story. I mean, after a little while, it's going to get out. You're not going to hide something like what happened to Mary back in the when Jesus was born. By this time, it would have been roughly 30 years ago. And so they were scoffing at him and they were saying, You can't do all of this. We're not even sure about your birth, who your daddy was. That's what they're telling him. And just like there were scoffers back then, there are doubts and scoffers today. And we have doubts about the virgin birth. We have doubts about the the deity of Jesus, about his death and his resurrection. I remember when I was younger, one of the big teachings, I don't know if y'all remember the Jesus Forum for a while, and, and they appointed themselves, and they were going to decide what parts of the gospel that Jesus actually said and what parts were just stories and things that people had said he said. And by the time they got through, there wasn't much of the gospels left. They had pretty much ripped them apart. And one of the primary things that they came out with is they said that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. And the word they used was swoon. They said he swooned. And I'm assuming that's like fainting that he fainted, and after he had laid and rested for a day or two, he revived and came back. That was their teaching. So there are scoffers today about all of the things of Jesus, and in particular, his his deity. And then you read in the book of 1 John, that's the thing that John says, and this is the test, 1 John chapter 4, for false prophets. He says, if they don't teach that Jesus has come in the flesh, and we've studied this before, in other words, if they don't teach that Jesus was God come in the flesh, he said, they're false prophets. That's the test. And today, that's one of the big things is the deity of Jesus. For example, even the Muslims teach that Jesus came, lived on earth, and died And that he will come back. But they teach that he was only a prophet. And they teach that when he comes back, he will come back as the forerunner for the true Messiah, who will be the great, I think the word is Mufti, and he will be the one that brings the Islamic State to all the world. So that's what they teach about Jesus. Uh, The Mormons... They teach Jesus, but they teach that he was just another God and that we can all eventually reach that state of gods. So there are scoffers today just like there were back then. And there will be scoffers today, and we see it even in the church about his second coming. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3. And this one is a big one with me right now. 
in particular with the growth of Calvinism and, and Praetorism and all of these things that are being thrown at us today. Every time, especially on my Thursday uh, teachings, and then uh, here a month or so ago, I did two Sunday mornings here talking about the rapture and the second coming. And uh, number one, those always get the most views. Anytime there's something in, in the title or something in one of my teachings about the rapture or the second coming, I can expect several hundred views. They also always get the most comments. And it's always, you're wrong. You can't prove the second coming. You can't prove the rapture. You can't prove all of that from Scripture. And uh, I'd rarely ever answer them, but if I do, I usually answer something pretty snide like, well, I just did. <laughs> so, with my, but anyway, I, I don't. But listen to what he says here in Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. He says, Dear friends, this is now the second letter that I have written to you. And in both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder, so that you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Now, verse 3, above all, be aware of this, scoffers will come in the last days scoffing and following their own evil desires. So watch that. How does the verse start? Above all, this, this is the number one thing. He spent the whole book warning us about false prophets and false teachers and, and the money that they're going to be after and the power. And now he says, but above all of that, he says, here's what you need to be aware of. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires. And what will they be scoffing? Verse 4, saying, where is his coming that he promised? Now, number one, this is not the first coming. Okay, Jesus has already been born, already lived, already died, already resurrected, and now the apostles are going throughout the known world preaching the gospel. So this is not questioning his first coming. This is questioning the promise and the prophecy that he gave about his second coming. And Peter tells us that above all, you need to be aware that they are going to cast doubt upon his second coming. Now, why is that of so much importance to you and me? Why would Peter say above all? Be aware that this is going to happen. Look at verse 17 of the same chapter. In verse 17, Peter says, Therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, know what? That they're going to be scoffers, and they're going to scoff about the second coming. He says, Since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position. You remember when I taught on this here a while back in our end time series that we did on Wednesday nights? And the point that I made in particular about chapter 3 is Peter is not writing this because he's concerned about the false prophets. That's not why he's writing it. He tells us that right up front. He says, I'm writing this to remind you so that you will remember what the Old Testament prophets and what the apostles said. And he said, I'm writing this not because I'm concerned about the false prophets because they're going to come. What I'm concerned about is that you, church, will get caught up with the false prophets. You'll get caught up in their scoffing and in their doctrines, and you will fall from your stable position. Folks, that's what happened to them in Jesus' day at the birth. When the announcement came, they all knew it. Herod, when the wise men came to him, he called the, his, his, his wise men, and he said, well, where will the Messiah be born? They knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew exactly what the scripture said about it, but they got caught up in the scoffing 
and eventually they pulled enough weight that basically the whole nation followed them and crucified Jesus. And that's what Peter is concerned about with you and me. As we see the signs, everything happening around us, 1948, everything that's happening with the rest of the world, Peter is afraid that we're going to get caught up with everybody else and say, oh, they've been saying that. Y'all been preaching that. Y'all are just making all this stuff up, and we're going to fall from our stable position. So there are going to be scoffers today just like there were back then, and then there are going to be those that are indifferent, just like the innkeeper, just like Caesar Augustus. There are going to be those, I ain't got time to be bothered. But you know what I think about? I think about those guys that, and, and I didn't look this up, it just it just popped in my head. Those guys that, that the, the, I think it was a rich man, and he sent out his servants to invite everybody to come into the feast. And one of them said, well, look, I can't go. I just bought a team of oxen, and I got to test them out. Another one said, hey, I can't go. I just bought some land, and I got to go see it. And then another one said, I can't go. I just got married, and I got to stay home with my wife. It, it, it was to them, hey, I, don't, I ain't got time to be bothered with that. I've got my own thing to do. I, I just really, I, I don't care. And back to the innkeeper. Had he known what was happening, I think it would have changed his whole attitude. Had he cared to find out what was happening. And when all of these rumors started going through Bethlehem, because I guarantee you when those shepherds, well, the Bible tells us when the shepherds left, they were telling everybody they met what had happened. They were running around spreading the word, and so was everybody else. But they were indifferent. I can't be bothered with that stuff. I've got too much going on. I've got my own life to live. That's the same way it is today. And then lastly, there will also be those that gladly hear the word and receive it. Christmas is one of Christmas and Easter, in my opinion, one of the best times to witness. Now, obviously, we should witness year round. That's not, I'm not saying that. But Christmas and Easter, for two reasons. Number one, Christmas and Easter is the only time of year that some people even think about religious things and think about Jesus and the church and things like that. And number two, Christmas and Easter give us the best opportunity in conversation to bring up Jesus and the things of the Lord, the gospel, without sounding like we're trying to force or trying to push our way into that conversation. And there are people, even in the world we live in today, that are ready to hear the gospel and be saved. But we can't be like these other people, indifferent, rejecting. We have got to be ready and willing to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things, back to the scoffers and, and, and us getting caught up in that doctrine, if we truly believe what we say we do, that Jesus can return at any moment for the church, and then after the rapture of the church, then the tribulation starts. If we truly believed it, we would be witnessing. We would be telling people because you and I know, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6, 7, and 8, that once that trumpet sounds, we're caught up out of here. Those that have heard the gospel have had that opportunity. God himself will send them a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. Think about the day of Noah. That's what the Lord said. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. How many of those people, after the rain started and the door to the ark was shut and sealed, how many of them do you think decided then they wanted on? Well, I imagine every one of them. How many of them had the opportunity? Not a single one of them. We've got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. We've got to tell them because there are those that 
can and will be saved. So yes, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. It should be a time of excitement. And my last statement is this. We, of all people, should be excited about Christmas because just like Jesus literally fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies about his birth, his life, his death and resurrection, he will also literally fulfill all of the prophecies about the rapture and his second coming. And so when we think about Christmas and what it means and what it stands for, it ought to give us all the confidence in the world that, yes, he was born. Yes, he died for my sins. Yes, he rose again so I can have eternal life. And, yes, he's coming again just like he said he would. Amen? Any questions, any comments? Anything before we be dismissed? Mm-hmm. The innkeeper had to have no room in the inn. Right. Right. You know. Yep. That's the way I believe it. It was already planned out. It was already planned out, you know. But that doesn't dismiss him from the responsibility. I know that gets into a serious discussion, but. Predestination. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the main themes all the way through the Bible is choose. Man has to choose. And that word, choose, is even used in many places, in many cases. So it, it's, a, it's a weighty matter. When Judas betrayed Christ, was, you know, he was going to be betrayed, and we know that from prophecy, too. Mm-hmm. But Judas still had a choice. Yeah. I lean toward... But it had to be fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. We wouldn't have a... Have a yeah, but I lean I lean toward foreknowledge. Mm-hmm. I think what was predestined yes, was did. that Jesus would be the only way of salvation. That if, if you're going to be saved, it's going to be through Jesus. And I think that the Lord, and we the, the scripture teaches us, He knows everything. He knows our thoughts even before we think them. So He knew what we were going to do and what was going to happen. And so I I lean more toward his foreknowledge than I do predestination that you're going to be saved and, you know, this is going to be this way. He knew Judas was going to betray. And so Jesus could with confidence say he's the son of predestination because God knew what he was going to do. That's my thoughts on it. But the innkeeper could have just completely... But thank God that he at least said, okay, well, you can have my, my stable, you know. So most people think it was probably a cave, but, but anyway, you know, thank God at least he did that. And let that be a lesson to us. Even when we seem like that there's nothing we can do, we can still do something, you know, there's, if we'll just let the Lord lead us and teach us. I think it teaches us that, you know, the king is going to be born, but he's not a king of wealth, and he's not a king of an army. Lovely he's, he's yeah. See, that's one of the things. If you go back and read some of those prophecies <laughs> that it says this was done in Jesus' birth, in particular Isaiah chapter 9, and that's the one where we read, for unto us a, a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, And then just in the same sentence, it says, you know, and the government will be upon his shoulders and and he will be the the king of. So when they read that, they didn't have the knowledge that we have today, looking back. So they said, man, this this, the Messiah is coming and he's going to be the government. He's going to rule everything. And so that's what they were looking for. And when Jesus came and began to preach and teach the kingdom the way he did, man, it it didn't set with them. That's not what they wanted. 
And part of that, you had asked here a while back, part of that goes back even to the to Maccabees. And, you know, they thought at one point that Judas Maccabees was the Messiah. That's why he was able to gather so many people to follow him. And there were others that came with him. They weren't looking. Now, I mentioned this the other day. I don't know if but I said Isaiah chapter 53. Go home and read that. The Jews are not allowed to read Isaiah chapter 53. That's the one, the prophecy of the suffering Savior. He was bruised for our iniquities. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God. The Jews aren't allowed to read that. You meet your average real Jew, you know, one that actually reads their stuff and follows, and they don't know Isaiah 53. They know everything else, but they don't know Isaiah 53 because it's forbidden, and that's why. And that's what, when Jesus and Nicodemus were discussing, you recall, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're, you're a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand what I'm telling you? That's what he was talking about. Nicodemus should have known because he knew the scriptures. So, yeah, they were looking for, they were looking for what they're going to get in the millennial kingdom. It's what they were wanting when Jesus came the first time. And that's uh, Jeremiah 31. That's it's all in there. That's powerful. I got excited this afternoon reading that and the, how the way the prophecies all flowed together. So, anything else? It's like they wanted a warrior, you know. They, they didn't want yeah. what he was And he will be. Yes, but they wanted that. Yeah, when he comes back. Right, right. He will be riding that white horse with the sword of his mouth, the word. Yeah, all of the pictures of Jesus in that time is his clothes are covered with blood. Um, all right, anything else? I had a little flashback there, kind of unrelated, but you were talking about the scoffers. We, uh, we had a, years ago we had a, had a pastor, he, he had a little speech impediment, but in, and I, I may have been dozing a little bit, something, but he... he <laughs> He said scopers. Scopers. He called scopers. I thought he said gophers. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. It kind of popped me out of my oh. daydream there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people have said, like, if you listen to Tony Evans, every time he preaches out of Galatians, it's how did. He says it funny. Galatians or. Yeah. <laughs> he says that funny. And then and a lot of people, they'll say, like, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, and that that may be what Tony Evans says, but he he says it funny too. Yeah.